Hello, and welcome to my channel. I'm Andrew, and I'm a bookish priest. Today, I want to discuss a book with you from a few years ago. The book is called Hex by Thomas Old Hoyveld. Thomas is Dutch. I don't speak Dutch. I do speak a little bit of German, and so if I'm mispronouncing your last name, I apologize. Uh, I don't know better. Not that Thomas will ever see this video, but here we are. If anybody out there knows how to pronounce his name properly in Dutch, I would love to know. Thank you. So, Hex uh, was published in English in 2016. It is a translation and slight revision of the Dutch version, uh, the original publication. I'm told that the English version is almost identical, but has a different ending that both reflects something that Thomas wanted to experiment with and something that the publisher thought would be more palatable to an American audience. I read the digital version of this book, so I don't have a copy to hold up to you, uh, but I will put the cover art here. So, what is Hex about? I will read you the blurb. Whoever is born here is doomed to stay till death. Whoever settles never leaves. Welcome to Black Spring, the seemingly picturesque Hudson Valley town haunted by the Black Rock Witch, a 17th century woman whose eyes and mouth are sewn shut. Muzzled, she walks the streets and enters homes at will. She stands next to children's beds for nights on end. Everybody knows that her eyes may never be opened, or the consequences will be too terrible to bear. The elders of Black Spring have virtually quarantined the town by using high-tech surveillance to prevent their curse from spreading. Frustrated with being kept in lockdown, the town's teenagers decide to break their strict regulations and go viral with the haunting. But... In so doing, they send the town spiraling into dark medieval practices of the distant past. While I talk about this book, I'm going to try to avoid spoilers, but I want to talk about some of the ideas that are presented here, and I may have to give away some plot points to do that, um, so viewer discretion is advised. I found Hex, on the one hand, to be a really fun, creepy, atmospheric horror book. Um, I love the setting of a small, somewhat remote, somewhat isolated town that has secrets to hide, a little bit of the supernatural, maybe some magic, skeletons in closets that may or may not be related to the supernatural and magic, it might just be average, weird, small town shit. I grew up in a small town and I know all about average, weird, small town shit. So in that way, it's just a fun, good horror book about a community that has been haunted for 400 years by the same witch, who they can't seem to get rid of. On the other hand, this book is a really interesting study in human nature, in aspects of human life like sin and redemption, of mob mentality and behavior, about the human tendency to scapegoat and the relationship between scapegoating and responsibility and shared corporate life in community. So as you may have guessed from that blurb on the back cover, about 400 years ago this village had a problem with a witch who was wreaking havoc in town, um, causing people to do all sorts of horrible things and doing horrible things to all sorts of people. The leaders of the town couldn't get rid of the witch. They tried their very best, and she just couldn't, couldn't be dealt with in a permanent way. And so what they did was they sewed her mouth and her eyes shut, and in so doing, prevented her from working any more curses or magic or encouraging people to do inappropriate things. The downside is that the witch has proved to be more or less immortal um, and cannot be kept out 
of town. Sometimes she is seen walking, and other times she simply appears where she wishes to be. As the blurb said, even if that is at the side or foot of your bed for days on end. In the life of the town, while they try to keep the presence of the witch secret-ish from people who are not from Black Spring, she is sort of used as a boogeyman. Children are threatened with encounters with her um, in hopes that they will behave, not that anyone can control what the witch does. She's used um, like a sort of all-purpose boogeyman scapegoat. Uh, things go missing, the witch must have taken them, that sort of stuff. The, the sort of thing that you would expect from a town that's lived for 400 years uh, being haunted by the same semi-dead immortal witch. The responses of the townspeople to the witch are really interesting. There are those who bully and taunt her, who go out of their way to bump into her, to poke her, to push her. She simply stands where she is. Um, but there are those who interact with her in a bullying fashion. And then there are those who hold the witch in a sort of reverence and worship her as some kind of unsettling but necessary supernatural presence in their town. What they think the necessity of her is varies, but they believe that she is there for a reason, whether she's there as a reminder of things that their ancestors have done and that they must consider, whether she's there as some kind of uh, martyrial remembrance or as a protectress of the town, different opinions, but these people hold her in regard, and you can imagine that there is conflict between those who would bully her and treat her like some kind of outcast other, and those who value her as a member of their community, even if she is a bit creepy. What is true of everyone in Black Spring, however, is that they all regard the witch with a degree of fear. The stories of what she did in the past are told and remembered both formally and informally in the life of the town, and the possibility that she might be able to do those things again if she is not engaged with and managed carefully is something that looms large for the people of Black Spring. So, the inciting incident from the blurb is that a group of teenagers who are tired of living with this and seeing all sorts of things on the internet, the first generation to have to do so, of course, and not being able to talk about their special thing, the thing that would win them great notoriety and fame online, decide that they're going to do it anyway. And so, as the haunting of Black Spring becomes a public matter, because it's now online, courtesy of smartphones and easy video, the level of anxiety in town begins to rise. Surely people from outside the town are going to come and want to see this witch and encounter her and engage with her and possibly bully her or take her away or un un unstitch her mouth and let her whisper horrible things in the ears of the townspeople again. And so, as that anxiety rises, the people of the town begin to reinforce expectations around engagement with the witch. Obviously, the children are chastised, you can't be doing this, and the way we engage with the witch needs to be monitored more carefully. We have become lax over so many years of peaceful interaction with her. Those habits about how we engage with the witch and making sure that she is stitched up good and proper need to be reinvigorated and reinforced. The last thing we want is for her terrorism of 400 years ago to return. As you can imagine, the townspeople are divided over what they think the appropriate response to public attention to their haunting, their particular uh, small town feature, like the world's biggest ball of spring seen on the side of an interstate, in Black Spring, we have haunting by a witch in perpet perpetuity, it seems. And so the townspeople begin to call out one another for 
doing the wrong thing. Something goes wrong in town, and now it's not the witch's fault. It's somebody else's fault because they didn't interact with the witch in the right way. They did something wrong. And the paranoia and the suspicion and the lashing out escalate quickly and reach ever greater heights until the townspeople end up visiting upon one another fates far worse than anything the witch is reputed to have done in the past. The situation finally resolves itself. It is not a happy ending. And a great deal is revealed about the consequences of sin, scapegoating, responsibility, and what happens when consequences that we have been so carefully and so energetically avoiding finally come to bear. One of my favorite expressions, when all of the bills come due at the same time. It's a great study in those sorts of human relationships. The atmosphere is uh, really wonderfully creepy. The setting is great. The vibe of the small town is solid. Some of the characters are a bit flat, and there is a strange fixation with female breasts that probably needed better editing. I have no idea whether this makes more sense in Dutch, either linguistically or culturally, um, but to a North American English language reader, it was a bit strange. Overall, a great creepy horror read. I think the book, while just a fun piece of fiction in its own right, also has a fair bit to say about the human tendency towards scapegoating and avoiding responsibility. So often, when we make a mistake, great or small, we want to have it be someone else's fault. If so-and-so had done such, that wouldn't have happened, or if so-and-so hadn't done such, that wouldn't have happened. And we see it all the time. Um, we see lynch mobs. We see Islamophobia, especially post-9-11. We see the incredible political division across the world, but especially in the United States, for this Canadian who is close by, where people want someone else to blame for their dissatisfaction with their lives. And it may well be that there is someone else to blame for the dissatisfaction in their lives, but it is most often not the person that they end up blaming because we want to blame someone that we are sure we can extract some kind of satisfaction from or foist some kind of punishment upon. So, um, I can blame, I don't know, the Prime Minister of Canada for all the woes in my life, uh, but the chances of my getting any satisfaction from that are rather limited. However, to quote my theology professor, if I come home from work frustrated and angry and decide to kick the cat, a thing that I would never do, I get the moment's satisfaction of having exacted some kind of control and power in my life. And these are the themes that play out in the story of Hex, between the townspeople, uh, between themselves, and between them and the witch. The eventual fate of the town reflects the corporate nature of sin, which is something that the people of the town don't spend a lot of time thinking and talking about, and we often do not think and talk about the corporate nature of sin, or redemption for that matter. We are so focused on individual action and individual responsibility that we forget, especially for a Christian community, which Black Spring is not explicitly, but this is the world that I live in, that we are all parts of a larger whole, and regardless of what we might think individually, we function holistically as part of that larger whole. And there are consequences to be reckoned with as a result of that. If my neighbor is cold or sick or hungry, I am cold and sick and hungry, and so it is to my benefit to make sure that my neighbor is warm 
and healthy and fed. I think Hex does a very fine job of exploring these realities without calling itself a philosophical, anthropological, or theological discussion. But it touches on a really fascinating set of ideas in a really great take on a trope of a haunted village with secrets and uh, just a great piece of contemporary horror writing. Those are my thoughts on Hex by Thomas Old Hoyveld. Something to think about reading as we approach autumn and creepy season in October, when everybody likes to read something a little bit scary. Have you read Hex? If so, what did you think? Does it sound interesting? Does it sound like not your thing at all? If you are a person who is in leadership in a church, I would love to know whether or not you think this would be a suitable theological book study. For a select group of parishioners, this is not something to give to the middle school youth group for reading. But I think if you had a group of theologically engaged adults who could handle some graphic gory content um, and some genuinely creepy stuff, this might make for a really interesting uh, discussion around sin, responsibility, community, and all of those aspects of theology. Let me know what you thought. Uh, do me a favor and like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the bell icon, you know the things that YouTubers ask you to do. Until next time, I'm Andrew, I'm a bookish priest, may all your reading be a blessing. Bye.